coffee. The one being we democratically elected to become the one being to rule them all. And without its sweet, sweet caffeine, global economic machines would come to a screeching halt, interpersonal relationships would crumble, and the world would drift into a dark era within an unwakeable slumber. Okay, maybe not quite that extreme. But it is rather interesting that this one little bean with psychoactive properties has ingrained itself so consistently into daily consumption. In the United States, well over half of our population drinks coffee every day, meaning that's about 150 million people that drink coffee every day. And that statistic is excluding the strong-minded people who can manage to skip a day every now and then. And America's, surprisingly, not even at the top of that list. Not even close. In fact, we slid in at 25th place for coffee consumption per capita, getting beat out by those majestic Finns who consume well over 26 pounds of coffee per capita, and even that number is on the low end, since children were excluded in that calculation. But we Americans don't like talking about the things that we're not number one at, so today's question takes us down a different path of global discovery. Why is it that coffee from different parts of the world tastes so different? And how can the same coffee beans sometimes taste delicious and sometimes taste, well, just bad? It's the same plant, so coffee should just be coffee, right? Turns out, that's a hard no, bud. After going down this rabbit hole adventure, it turns out there's a ridiculous amount of variables that goes into what makes your coffee either taste like sweet nectar from the heavens or a sock filled with dirty ashtrays. Here's just a few. Latitude, climate, elevation, plant species, varietal, soil composition, nutrient density, how it's processed, washed, semi-washed, natural dry processing, roasting method, roasting length, roasting temperature, single origin versus blended origin, time to packaging, air seal quality, exposure to light, time between roast and grind, grind consistency, how it's brewed, water pH, mineral composition, espresso, pour over fret. Okay, I think you get the point. <sighs> I think the best way to boil this down is, you can't just grow coffee anywhere. Otherwise, the entire state of Nebraska would be pumping out these little caffeine nuggets by the metric ton. Most coffee growth occurs in what's called the coffee belt, which is the land that's contained between the tropics of Capricorn and the tropics of Cancer. These areas provide the climate sweet spot for coffee to grow, specifically because it has a climate similar to the one of coffee's plant's origin country, Ethiopia. But first, if you have a favorite country of origin for your coffee, real quick, scroll down and leave the name in the comments. Then on your way back up, smack the like button for the YouTube algorithm. Okay, we're back. So step one, complete. You have to be able to grow the dang plants, obviously. Now to step two of what differentiates the flavor of coffee, soil composition, which varies drastically from the environment of each country's unique ecosystems. It's not surprising that soil composition would affect the flavor of the plants grown in it. But some variables were less obvious to me, like how volcanic soils, like the ones found in Colombia or Nicaragua, provide higher water holding capacity, which allows the roots to open up, directly affecting the oily substances and lipids contained within the bean. Soil management also determines if a soil is high or low maintenance, which would allow it to not need fertilizer, pesticides, or other chemicals and additives that could not only be extremely bad for your health, but more importantly, affect the precious taste of your coffee. The next major factor in taste by country is what method of processing works best for their specific region. To simplify, we'll split these two processing types into wet processing and dry processing. Wet processing involves placing the coffee and the cherries in large vats of water, which separates the good and bad beans out by their density. And then they're dried out without the cherry, which brings out an entirely different flavor profile. Dry processing in the traditional approach is where the coffee beans and cherries after harvest are simply laid out to dry and periodically raked and turned throughout the drying process to keep them from rotting or molding. Which process is selected is often a choice out of necessity. Countries that have less access to water, like some Ethiopian coffee operations, will opt to use a natural or dry process, which produces a fruitier and heavier body since the bean absorbs some of the sugars from the surrounding fruit. The wet process produces a cleaner taste in the mouth with a brighter, higher acidity, which resembles more closely what we would coin the coffee flavor. This is mostly what contains the flavor differences by region the coffee was produced in. Everything beyond that point in the coffee's consuming experience comes down to how the different flavor profiles are brought out of the coffee during preparation. After its processing, the roasting of the coffee bean is a true balancing act, 
too short and too hot, and you'll end up with a weak and acidic coffee. But roast it too long, and you'll burn out everything that makes it good. Kind of like what happens when you roast your friends. Whether you prefer a light roast or a dark roast, there's some general thresholds that your coffee has to reach during its roasting process. Just like when you cook your food, coffee undergoes a caramelization process, which begins to break down the sugars and transform the flavors. This happens right between 350 and 390 degrees. If you've ever been to a coffee shop when coffee's roasting, this is when you hear what's called the first crack, since CO2 is rapidly released during this phase. This is what gives coffee its sweetness. The next phase is how to find that balance of sweetness and bitterness in your life. I mean, in your coffee. I'm not licensed to help you with that. A compound called trigonaline is where coffee gets its distinctive earthy bitter flavor, and it begins to break down past 380 degrees. So anything beyond that is where you start to tilt the scales and how bitter your coffee is going to be. Once you get into that territory of dark roast, most of the trigonaline and other acids have been broken down, indicated by the creatively named second crack, you begin to taste more of the flavor notes of the roast than the characteristics of the specific qualities of the coffee's origin. Once you're ready to brew your coffee, remember this simple rule. Always grind your beans fresh. Unless you like the pungent aroma flavor of stale dirt, then, well, do your thing. The reason why is that ground coffee begins to interact with the air and oxidize, so it's difficult for it to stay fresh for very long. And speaking of pulverizing your coffee beans into dust, the size of your grind will be determined largely by what type of brewing method you're going to use. A fine to medium grind works well for a pour over, where a more coarse grind is suitable for a French roast, since, you know, you're supposed to drink your coffee, not digest coffee sediment. But here's the deal. Taste is a matter of personal preference. And just like bad ideas, everybody has them, but they all stink. I'm pretty sure that's how that saying goes. Yeah, that's the right one. Hey, you. Yeah, you. Thanks for watching. And if you have questions you want to see answered on this channel, drop them in the comment section below. And if you haven't already, drop down to that subscribe button and give that bell a ring. And like always, show the YouTube algorithm who's boss by destroying the like button. Because the YouTube algorithm runs on two things, hope and magic. I mean, views and likes.